The hearts of men are naturally curious, for nature and the universe designed it to be so. It's the one endearing trait that ultimately differentiates man from the smartest among the denizens of creation. Make no mistake, the natural world teems with intelligent life, with creatures capable of communication, higher level reasoning, and using simple and even complex tools. But a somewhat thin spectral line is drawn between man and the other intelligent creatures of the world, a frail wisp of a line, but it is unmistakably there nonetheless. Whilst other creatures are capable of being curious, only man has the penchant ability to frame intangible curiosity into something that could ultimately be manipulated, cajoled, or manhandled into something that could be brought to fruition. Yes, not only is man curious, man is equipped and driven as well. And he will always strive to satisfy his insatiable curiosity even if it kills his neighbor's cat. Dangle a worthwhile challenge in the face of humankind and somewhere, somehow, and some when, someone will gamely accept it, if it's enough to pique their particular interest. And an ancient while ago, in a dreamy faraway place, an endearing scholarly old man hatched the metaphysically paradoxical notion of transmuting a lump of ordinary lead into a nugget of gold. How he would do it, he would very likely figure things out, for he was an alchemist, and a very good and experienced one at that. As for why he would do it, well, nobody exactly knows. Maybe if he really thought about the reason, he would simply say because he thought about it. In any case, this is his story. On the first day, the old alchemist decided to tackle the problem of transmuting lead into gold using the classical approach. He would have to employ the grand plethora of arcane lore that enabled great alchemists of old to effectively commune with inanimate objects in a manner the objects would undoubtedly understand, in order to make them undoubtedly do what the ancient alchemists undoubtedly wanted. He figured that in order to transmute the fist-sized lump of lead on the kitchen table in front of him into gold, he would have to reach deep into its metallic heart of hearts and utterly convince it that it was indeed gold, and not just some painfully ordinary blob of lead. In effect, it must be able to look deep into its heavy soul, and see and feel within itself and entirely believe without a quantum iota of doubt that it really was gold. And the key, the old alchemist continued, will be to change its color, in order to persuade it to transmute. It's only logical, the old man mused, any self-respecting lump of lead would naturally think itself gold, if indeed it were of a golden color. For it's a well-known fact that lead, and some of the other lower metals, are rather doltish and generally thick in the head, and they would very likely fall for the simple reason that if they look like gold, and if they weigh like gold, and if they taste like gold, then they must really be gold. The logic may be simple, but it is undeniably sound, the old alchemist convinced himself, very much unquestionably so. As the old man stared at the lump of metal on the table, he continued his mental speculation and its derivative line of thought. Lead's countenance of sodden charcoal and ash, which unmistakably depicts its generally grumpy demeanor, must be enlivened for it to radiate the effervescently stunning hues of sunsets. The old alchemist continued in sudden nostalgia, one does tend to miss the setting sun's golden palette, practically a daily spectacle witnessed in the fishing villages and coastal towns several days worth of travel eastwards. After a momentary pause, the old man seemed to have recovered his original line of thought. For lead is a cranky old metal, he continued, whereas gold is a proud and haughty upstart. It will be difficult, but it will be doable, the old man concluded. No one in particular disputed the old and endearingly senile alchemist, for he was alone in a secluded cottage deep in the woods in the outskirts of town. His three apprentices were still out and about, gathering the ingredients the alchemist ordered them to acquire several days prior, and they should all be arriving any minute this morning. With the procured inventory complete, 
The kitchen table was filled with a bizarre collection of seemingly unrelated ingredients, and it practically looked as if a tiny and polite tornado meticulously arranged random debris on the table, taking great care in placing them into neat orderly piles. Nevertheless, random debris they still were, and there was hardly any plausible connection between any of them, even by the wildest stretch of sane imagination. But for all that, the old alchemist was very much sure that these ingredients would effectively effect the cosmetic change that would ultimately convince the possibly skeptic lump of lead that it was actually a valuable gold nugget. There was a clump of earth taken at exactly midnight from the grave of a recently deceased blonde maiden from three towns away, may her soul blissfully rest in peace. The taking of such potent raw material was no light matter, for the apprentice assigned to the task must cleanse himself first by eating only overripe fuzzy pears exactly 24 hours before executing the task. Respectful precedence is of the essence, the old alchemist stressed. There was a vial of the first morning piss of a yellow-haired virgin from the nearby village. This was especially tricky to acquire, since the urine must be from a batch just before the young woman's first menstrual cycle this summer. Absolute purity is of the essence, the alchemist stressed. There was a bundle of golden strands of corn tufts, from the 18th year of corn to be picked in this summer's harvest. It had to be the 18th insisted the old alchemist, for 18th was the ranked importance of gold in the Encyclopedia Arcana. There was a bottle containing a moistly glistening bright yellow tree frog, procured from a traveling merchant of exotic goods who also dabbled in apothecaries of sorts. This, the merchant guaranteed, was the real thing, for it directly came from the ancient forests of the distant realm of verdant Brasilia. It must be handled carefully, the portly trader warned, lest one wants to expire in an excruciatingly painful gurgling fit of convulsion, while hysterically laughing in spite of the agonizing pain. The frog was particularly expensive, but it had to be procured since it was one of many key ingredients. According to the alchemist, the frog would imbue the lead with implicit poison, not unlike the poisonous greed and unmistakable craziness that gold imparts within the hearts of men. There was a bowl of brass and bronze shavings speckled with dried blood. These were taken from the brass and bronze swords of fallen foot soldiers in the wars that intermittently raged in the dark and foggy lands across the North Sea. These, the alchemist figured, would introduce the lump of lead to gold's despicable lesser cousins, typically used for mundane and unexciting things. It was the old man's hope that that should help to convince the lump of lead to decide on being gold rather than foolish and nondescript brass or bronze. There was a jar of fresh sickly yellow runny feces from a jaundiced infant boy. According to the old alchemist, this was to impart the paradoxical attractiveness of gold to adults, and not to children. For documented observations conclusively demonstrate that infants and toddlers would rather fondly play with their own manure, instead of with a lump of unrefined gold ore, the alchemist reasoned. There was a pitcher of sweet-smelling sweet honey, from a fetchingly attractive widowed beekeeper, whose bees have particularly bright yellow stripes. This particular errand, the old alchemist ran himself. For he honestly found bees to be hypnotically mesmerizing to watch, especially when tended by their fetchingly attractive widowed beekeeper. And besides, the old man needed the honey, for gold is the sweet result of hard work and success the very attributes of both the honey and the bees that produced them. Watching the fetchingly attractive widowed beekeeper harvest the honey really had nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing at all, honest. There were other esoteric ingredients, which the alchemist never cared to explain when the apprentices asked what they were for. There was a cup of bright yellow fish sauce with a repugnantly delicious aroma, made by the Orientals who were living in tightly knit clusters in the great city. There was a pot of strong smelling yellow sulfur powder, ground from volcanic deposits mined from far away exploding mountains. There were several rows of aromatic spices, all ranging in color from light yellow to deep orange. 
There were piles of assorted pickled yellow autumn leaves, harvested from different forest trees last autumn, before cold enough weather gave them a chance to turn orange or red. And lastly, there was a large block of beautifully luminous yellow amber, from trees in mysterious Asia that profusely and at the same time annoyingly shed and scatter little yellow flowers during the vibrantly bright summer days of April, causing much distress and aggravation to cantankerous old street sweepers. On this last one, the old alchemist indulged the apprentices and explained its relevance. If gold indeed were as abundant as the April shower of small bright yellow flowers, it would really be distressful and rather quite aggravating. After the inventory audit was complete, the alchemist and his apprentices proceeded to set everything up. Fires were lit and the furnace hearth was soon fiercely ablaze. Before long, thick smoke interlaced with steam was rowdily billowing out of the cottage's blackened chimney stack, in an obviously hurried rush to get out and away from the cottage, and the strange activities inside of it. Solids were ground and liquids were mixed. Stuffs were reduced to their essences, and powders were extracted and reconstituted. Everything was measured exactingly, since alchemy was an exact and logical science that had no place for mumbo-jumbo incantations and all that gibberish nonsense. By late afternoon, the secluded cottage in the woods was filled with noxious fumes, and the eyes of its occupants were watery, due to the slightly stinging air. Any casual observer who would suddenly drop by and barge in would very likely assume that someone very close to the busily bustling old man and his three apprentices must have recently died, for they were teary-eyed and constantly sniveling uncontrollably as they silently worked. No such thing happened of course, for this bunch is used to the rigors of working the alchemy craft, and a noxious work environment was really nothing new to them. In any case, their exhaustive labor had been completed by nightfall, and a nicely yellow slurry was lazily boiling in the crucible above the furnace. Truly the old alchemist knew his craft, for who else could have concocted such an esoteric stew? When the time was right, the old man carefully plopped the lump of lead into the boiling mix specifically formulated to convince it that it was gold instead of lead. It was left to simmer for exactly one hour. When the time has elapsed, one of the apprentices extracted the material from the pot, and dropped it into a bucket of freshly drawn cold spring water. Immediately after it cooled down, the old alchemist fished out then dried the material using an old kitchen rag. Lo and behold, for in front of them was a dull orange lump of metal. Giddy with guarded excitement, the alchemist proceeded with the first test as the three odd apprentices watched on. The lump of metal was peremptorily shaped with a chisel under a tabletop mounted magnifying glass. And when a small sliver was broken off, all elation evaporated, and palpably thick disappointment pervaded the room. For the magnifying lens revealed that only the skin of the lump was colored orange, and the inside of the lump was still ugly bluish gray lead. With that, everyone dejectedly left the cottage with a heavy heart, and went straight home for the night. On the second day, the old alchemist returned early before dawn to the cottage, with a smile on his face and a youthful spring in his step. For after taking stock of all that had happened the previous day, he belatedly realized in consternation that he should have expected as much. Had he been able to, he would have lovingly kicked himself in his behind. Physiological limitations notwithstanding, the old man contented himself with some half-hearted personal chiding, followed by a humble acceptance of full-blown self-congratulations. For all intents and purposes, they didn't actually fail yesterday. In truth, the old man realized that yesterday was just the first step among many that had to be taken, in order to complete the transmutation process. At the very least, the old alchemist was happy that he had a handle and a firm grip on the situation. As the sun rose, the still downcast apprentices arrived one by one, with an air of forlorn still hanging about them. Take heart my young students, the old alchemist beamed, for all is not lost. It turns out that our particular lump of lead is a peculiarly stubborn one. 
I suspect that it had not been chemically aggregated well by its mother load. And very likely it suffered a traumatic experience of some sort during its formative years. Nevertheless, at the very least, we were able to convince it yesterday to think that it is gold, hence it changed its color, albeit superficially. Today my young lads, we must be diligent in our efforts to convince it to act like it is gold. We must walk it through the transmutation process with baby steps. For yesterday showed me that our lump of lead is more sass than mass, and is rather a juvenile delinquent of sorts. And with that encouraging speech, they started the day's work. And soon enough, all traces of yesterday's setback evaporated with the morning mist, as the vibrant sun rose for another gloriously exhilarating day. This time around, the three apprentices found the ingredients easier to acquire. For one thing, a lot of what was left over from yesterday can still be used. For another, the now cold yellow slurry can still be utilized, requiring only very little adjustment. But for the most part, the objective for the day was mostly to convince the now orange lump of lead to act like it is gold, instead of outright telling it to turn into one. And for that, pragmatically practical ingredients were required, instead of the mysterious esoteric stuff they had to previously accumulate. So the nature of the new ingredients on the once again cluttered kitchen table were more for convincing, rather than for commanding. There were the shredded remains of the village leader's stolen yellow hat. It had to be stolen, the alchemist reasoned, for gold is more likely to be stolen rather than given away. And it had to be from a politician, the old man continued, for who is better than anyone at convincing people? Next there was the likewise shredded remains of the yellow purse stolen from the village leader's wife. The apprentices now knew why it had to be stolen, and to their credit, they figured out that gold translates to money, and money is kept in purses. The alchemist proudly beamed at their correct reasoning, but to that, he affectionately added that it must be from the politician's wife, for who else could be able to convince the politician himself? Next there was a bag of feathers from noisy little plump yellow canaries. For according to the alchemist, the mesmerizingly angelic sweet song of canaries can oftentimes convince even the most sullen of individuals to cheer up for no bloody reason at all. Next there was a pail of fine yellow sand, acquired from an olive-skinned trader from the Middle East. This was especially potent, according to the alchemist for there is an inherent natural attraction in desert sands that can ultimately convince people to live and thrive in such harsh places. For the other passive ingredients, the alchemist didn't care to explain once more. There were several small bags of mixed tufts of male and female blonde hair with a 1 to 3 ratio by weight, meticulously acquired from trashed bins of beauty and barber shops scattered around the nearby villages. There was an envelope containing yellowed fingernail and toenail clippings from the same blonde virgin that provided the fresh urine yesterday. There was a small jar of stinking yellow rotted teeth hygienically rummaged from the village dentist's foul-smelling trash bin. And there was a yellow wooden ball which they had to convince a blonde boy child to freely give them. To complete the list, the alchemist promptly went on an errand himself to order a fresh pitcher of honey from the fetchingly attractive widowed beekeeper from yesterday. Personal reasons aside, the old man suspected that their lump of lead was of the male disposition, and thus had to be treated with more sweetness, hence the orange color achieved yesterday. With the ingredients complete, the motley team got to work. The cottage was once again filled with the hustle and bustle of industry and the sooty chimney stack was once more spewing smoke that appeared to be much livelier than yesterday. Once again, archaic processes were employed, and the ingredients were duly transformed from one form to another, extracting them in their most potent states, and marrying them in unbelievable compounds that would never ever occur naturally. By late afternoon, they had achieved another boiling slurry, but this time, the color was more on the whitish side of ever so slightly yellow. To this they added an exactly measured dollop of the now adjusted nicely yellow slurry from yesterday. 
The result was a thicker stew with a more vibrant bright yellow color. Once again, when the time was right, the now orange lump of lead was submerged and stewed for exactly an hour. After which, it was taken out and rinsed in cold water once more. To everyone's surprise, including the old alchemist, the previously dull orange lump was now lighter and shinier in color. Once more the old man shaved out a sliver, and was pleased to find out that the color change was not superficial. The old alchemist cut slightly deeper into the lump, and still the color was consistent. My dear boys, he radiantly beamed, this is not yet gold, but it appears that we have finally convinced our stubborn little lump that it is no longer lead. By late evening, everyone left encouraged and elated, for they were undoubtedly on the correct track. On the third day, everyone arrived in the cottage early before dawn, and the apprentices were raring and eager to execute what was next. Getting a jump start on the day, the old alchemist immediately proceeded to explain to the apprentices what the next activities were. On the first day, they somewhat managed to convince the seemingly reticent lump of lead to think that it is gold. Yesterday, they managed to further convince the lump to act like it is gold. And today, they had the exciting and exotic task of further convincing the lump to believe that it is gold. And with that, the ingredients were listed, and the apprentices merrily went on their individually assigned ways. And what a short and quick morning it was, for in no time at all, all the ingredients to convince their now brightly orange lump of metal to believe it is gold filled up the once more sprawling kitchen table. For in today's activities, the active ingredients were far from eccentric, and were surprisingly rather quite mundane. The small pail of slippery egg yolks will instill our stubborn lump with gold's attribute of transient stewardship, explained the alchemist, for whoever has gold never seems to be able to hold on to it for long. The deliciously smelly block of bright yellow cheese is to imbue in our lump the common desire for gold exhibited by rich and poor men alike, an attribute shared by cheese, gourmet or otherwise since we all know that cheese is a poor man's meat and a rich man's treat, explained the old man. And thus he continued on. The pan of melted butter is for the attribute of non-adherence, explained the alchemist, since gold never really belongs to anyone for long. The bag of yellow wheat flour is for the attribute of diminishing multiplicity, since it takes several bushels of wheat grains to make a single bag of flour much the same way it takes several sacks of coins to buy a single bar of gold. The sack of sunflower seeds is for the attribute of commanded appreciation, for just like the sun attracting the sunflower, gold continuously tugs at the hearts of men. The bottle of olive oil is for the attribute of perpetual desire, for olive oil never sleeps in winter unlike other oils, much the same way that men never cease the want for gold. The bag of lemons is for the attribute of painful loss, for lemon and wounds do not mix very well, much the same way it extremely pains a man to part with his gold. The hand of ripe bananas is for the attribute of perpetual risk, for banana peels are known to cause people to slip and fall down, much like gold is known for causing a person's downfall. The small snuff box of yellow saffron is for the attribute of implied affluence, for only the rich can afford gourmet saffron dishes, and anyone who is rich most likely has gold. And last to be explained was the basket of ripe mangoes. It's for the attribute of possessive fondness, the old alchemist explained, for a mango is shaped like a heart, and men will always love gold. After which, the three apprentices couldn't resist asking what the small bottle of dark brown maple syrup was for since it totally deviated from the obvious color theme. To which the alchemist promptly replied, it was for their breakfast, since they were having pancakes that morning. Truth be told, the kitchen table that morning looked like it belonged more to a baker, or a candy maker, or a pastry chef, rather than to an alchemist. And indeed, for an apprehensive moment, the three diligent apprentices really thought they would be making delightfully sweet treats that day, 
instead of convincing their stubborn lump of metal to believe in its heart of hearts that it is gold. But that whimsical notion quickly left them after breakfast, when instructions were given, and they started the day's work. Unlike in the previous days when they made boiling slurries, the activities for today were totally different. A pleasant break from routine indeed. First up was to dehydrate then desiccate then pulverize into fine powder the bulky ingredients. After which, they had to incorporate it with the other powdery materials then integrate this admixture with the wet ingredients to form a sweet smelling mortar. After which, they wrapped the bright orange lump of metal with the mortar, forming a uniform cube shape. This cube was then sprinkled with the leftover desert sands from yesterday. The process of forming a cube and sprinkling with sand was repeated a total of three times, resulting in a cubic shell or casing with three layers. This is extremely important, stressed the old alchemist, for a cube has six sides, and six multiplied by three is eighteen, and eighteen is the ranked importance of gold according to the Encyclopedia Arcana. After which, the cube was placed into the furnace hearth and was left to bake for exactly one hour. When the time has elapsed, the glowing hot cake mass was removed from the hearth and dropped into a pail of cold spring water to quench it. Lo and behold, after the shell spontaneously dissolved in the water in a frighteningly violent flurry of tiny little enraged bubbles, the old alchemist fished out a bright yellow lump of metal that beautifully glinted in the firelight. Time flew fast that day amidst the scurrying activities, and it was now early evening. Once again the shaving test was repeated, and it turned out that the bright yellow color went all the way through. Closely guarded joy filled the smoky cottage, but the smiling old alchemist cautiously cautioned the apprentices to cushion their expectations, for he was about to perform the second test. My dear boys, Although our once dull lump of metal has been convinced to think that it is gold, and has been convinced to act like it is gold, and has just now been convinced to believe that it is gold, it still has not become gold. And with that, he dropped the shiny yellow lump into a fresh pail of cold water and it promptly floated, lazily bobbing up and down on the water's surface, like a portly middle-aged merchant on a Saturday morning beach escapade. One couldn't determine if the resulting incredulous expression on the boys' faces were of wonder or of disappointment, for never in their lives have they seen nor heard of a heftily solid lump of metal floating in water. In the end, after the shock and delight of the spectacle had passed, there was a general feeling of levity in the air, and everyone went home excited for the next day's activities. For tomorrow they will try to convince the bright yellow metal to take its final baby steps and finally become gold. On the fourth day, the apprentices arrived at the cottage earlier than the old alchemist, for such was their unbridled excitement. When the old man finally joined them a little later, they were boisterously bantering with each other and bouncing about in the cottage yard with uncontained joy, like a litter of rambunctious little fat fluffy puppies. The early morning sun seemed to shine brighter when the old alchemist beamed at finding his apprentices unabashedly excited for the day's activities. My dear boys, he solemnly greeted them, a fine morning to us all, for today we shall finally convince our little lump of metal to become gold. The sassy little mass now thinks that it is gold. The cheeky little bugger now acts like it is gold. The crazy little crud now believes that it is gold. And today we must all be fatherly and encouraging in our efforts to convince the skeptical metal to become gold. For just like any one of us who wishes to become a better person, it is not enough just to think like somebody else, nor to just act like somebody else, nor to just believe that we are somebody else. What will truly help us the most in our quest to transform into a better person is to become that somebody else, the somebody else who is a better person, the better person who is not us right now. At the moment, like our formerly led but soon to be gold little metal. The old alchemist rambled, quickly losing steam in his attempt at a rousing speech to rally the troops. He needlessly worried though, 
for the apprentices greedily drank in every last bit of the endearing old alchemist's words, and were thus buoyed with barely contained enthusiasm for the day's work ahead. If the past three days ever seemed strange at all, the activities on the fourth day could only be described as bizarre. The main objective, the alchemist explained, is to make our unsuspecting lump of bright yellow metal experience and live the actual life of gold. To kick it off, one apprentice went down a dry well and buried the yellow lump. After exactly an hour, another apprentice went down the same dry well to dig it up, taking care to evenly coat it with enough damp dirt to form a decent sized ball of mud. The mud ball was then passed to the third apprentice who promptly dropped it into a vat of boiling sunflower oil, and left it to deep fry for exactly one hour after it completely lost its mud coat. After which, the yellow lump was extracted from the boiling oil, then cooled and cleaned and ceremoniously sold to the old alchemist for 18 coins, for 18 is the ranked importance of gold in the Encyclopedia Arcana. After which, the first apprentice ceremoniously stole the lump from the alchemist and buried it in the woods. He drew a map to where he buried the item, and hid the map among the pages of an old cartographic almanac that was somehow conveniently lying on the kitchen table. The book was ceremoniously found by the second apprentice, and the lad did all his best to act genuinely surprised when he found the map amongst the pages. He then promptly dug the yellow lump exactly an hour after finding the map. When the lump was dug up, it was cleaned and ceremoniously sold to the third apprentice for another 18 coins, and this apprentice placed the lump in a shallow pit in the center of the cottage yard, and covered it with an equal mixture of ordinary scent and salt. Afterwards, a heartily blazing bonfire was built and meticulously maintained above the pit where the lump was buried. After exactly one hour, the burning firewood was removed and all smoldering charcoal, glowing embers, and hot ash were scraped away. The sand pit where the yellow lump of metal was buried was allowed to cool for exactly another hour, and everyone waited with bated breath, for that was the last step in the transmutation process. When the hour was up, the old alchemist dug out the yellow lump as the young apprentices watched with tense and shallow breaths. Lo and behold, for even having just been dug up, the yellow lump was shinier and the color was more vibrant than before. Everyone was extremely excited at the result, and were thus beside themselves with anticipation as they headed back into the cottage to redo the last water test. With great flourish, the alchemist dropped a shiny yellow lump in a fresh pail of water, and the metal behaved properly by promptly sinking and staying innocently sunk at the bottom. The room abruptly erupted in unconstrained joyous cheers, for everybody suddenly started jumping up and down with joy, and laughing out loud while clapping each other's back. One of the apprentices extracted the yellow metal from the bottom of the pail and wiped it dry, then passed it around for everyone else to marvel at its undeniable beauty, the yellowish lump finally ending up in the trembling hands of the old alchemist. When the initial rush had finally died down and everyone sobered up, the room became solemn once more. For there was an exactingly critical final test to be performed before they can categorically say that they truly succeeded. Slowly and with visible hesitation, the old alchemist brought the yellow lump to his mouth and chomped on it, his teeth leaving small unmistakable indentations on the yellow metal's surface. Without a word and with trembling arms, he passed it to the closest apprentice and this one in turn brought it to his mouth and did the same. With tears visibly welling in his eyes, he passed it to the next apprentice and this one too slowly did likewise. He was uncontrollably sobbing when he passed it on to the last apprentice, and this one similarly brought the lump to his mouth and did what the others did. As the last apprentice returned the shiny yellow lump to the old alchemist, they were now all crying, whimpering, and sniveling, as they embraced each other and clapped each other's back. For after so much hard work, they finally succeeded in transmuting lead into gold. But sad to say, they will never be able to repeat what they did. For elsewhere in the infinite multiverse, 
The international team of scientists, engineers, and technicians aboard the Universal Space Station were finally able to fix the problem on the nearby large orbiting linear particle collider. In the last four days, it had definitely been smashing heavy atoms against each other, and yet the neutrinos and the gamma radiation that the collider should be harvesting never materialized. All readings indicate that quantum collisions were indeed taking place in the supermagnetic tunnels, and yet the matter-antimatter traps remain empty, and the radiation nets report zero perturbations. In effect, the matter and energy that should have been released after each and every verified particle collision never materialized. It was a head-scratching last four days for the stump and puzzle team, and they quickly wrote off the apparently missing matter and energy as some sort of sensor aberration somewhere in the magnificently complex collider. Nevertheless, all that is now moot and academic, since one of the technicians finally found and promptly fixed the problem. As it turns out, one of the low-gain elemental Einsteinian crystals in one of the superconducting resonator arrays had a small crack, very likely due to load cycle fatigue. This particular array was responsible for accelerating the particles through the magnetic tunnels. And what it had been doing in the last four days was to hyper-accelerate the converging particles infinitesimal moments right before they collide with each other. Effectively, the particles are infinitesimally stretched just before they smash into each other at significantly higher speeds than expected. Apparently, the result was that because string forces were significantly weakened by stretching during sudden acceleration moments before collision, the compromised particles collide with each other so fast that they smash themselves into smithereens with nothing left. And this is quite unacceptable for the orbiting linear particle collider was designed and built to harvest matter-antimatter energies and not for some highfalutin pie-in-the-sky theoretical research. It was the general opinion of the whole team aboard the Universal Space Station that if anyone wanted to further study hyper-accelerated particle collisions, then they had better build themselves another orbiting collider, for this one is rather busy, thank you very much. The entirety of creation is a stingy miser, and Rudolf Clausius and those who came after him were not entirely correct in their formulation of the first law of thermodynamics. What they should have categorically stated was, the amount of matter and energy in the multiverse and not just the universe is constant. They apparently neglected to take into account the instance upon instance upon instance of paradoxically concurrent parallel realities, multiple universes that simultaneously coexist in the unimaginably vast yet finite space-time continuum. For the apparent lack of professionalism of the orbiting particle collider's repair and maintenance crew, and the apparent luck of the endearing old alchemist and his eager young apprentices are intertwined. Lead will never transmute into gold unless its elementary particle architecture is restructured accordingly. And matter and energy will never be arbitrarily lost somewhere, even inside a magnificently sophisticated state-of-the-art particle collider, for it should always manifest or revert into something somewhere. So it was only to be expected then that when matter and energy was being lost for four days in the universe with the orbiting linear particle collider, exactly the same amount of matter and energy was being gained in that same period of time in the alternate universe with the old alchemist. And by virtue of the serendipitous accidental trans-universal reallocation of elementary particles and energy, the old man and his apprentices were able to transmute lead into gold. And all is well that ends well, for the first law of thermodynamics was never really violated, or even circumvented at the very least. Matter and energy in the multiverse was neither created nor destroyed, merely transformed from one form to another, albeit in different parallel universes. In this, the greatest feat of accounting that relentlessly plays out since the beginning of space-time itself, the books are always perfectly balanced. And this, my dears, is the end of the story. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, 
Please click like or leave a comment or share this with friends. Please consider subscribing for this will help us make more stories. Don't forget to hit the bell or notification icon for the latest videos. Until next time.